Hi, board certified dermatologist and skin wellness expert, Dr. Cynthia Bailey, and today I'm going to talk about melasma and what you can do with your skin care to help melasma. I'm going to be talking about the pathophysiology of melasma, and that's why I've, I've drawn this kind of funny picture for you. And pathophysiology is a way of saying the mechanisms, the physiologic mechanisms of all the chemistry and the way the cells interact with each other that are pathologic or not in our best interest. So the pathophysiology of melasma is now becoming better understood. It's not simply a condition of hyperpigmentation. Melasma is also called the mask of pregnancy. It's big blotchy brown marks on the skin due to um, an abnormality in the way the skin processes hormones, and it can happen to both men and to women. Melasma is actually pretty common. One group of investigators in Dallas did a telephone survey of a lot of people, and it looked like in Dallas about maybe 9% of the population suffer from what would be considered melasma. They described it and, and asked, you know, do you have it? And, and so it looks like about perhaps 9%. It's more common in women, but it's not just limited to women. Men can suffer from melasma as well. And it can be very stigmatizing and actually very socially isolating because people with melasma are, are very embarrassed by it and try to cover it up, try to control it, but it, it does cause quite a bit of heartache. And uh, so the, you know, if you have melasma, you know, and um, if you know someone with melasma, you may or may not realize how much they're suffering this uh, stigmatizing and somewhat disfiguring skin condition. And so I want to give you some ideas about what you can do about it. So um, first, I want to talk about you know, the differences in facial hyperpigmentation that is melasma and that is, is not melasma. So with melasma, the hyperpigmentation tends to be more around the central forehead and it's symmetric as well. So central forehead, the cheeks, especially above the cheeks here, but in really bad cases, it can go all the way down, but it doesn't tend to cross the mandible here. So hyperpigmentation on the sides of the neck is not melasma. That's more likely to be poikiloderma of savat, which is a different form of sun damage, but it's not melasma. Um, in addition, you can have it on the upper lip here, and um, symmetrically on the lateral aspect of the eyebrows. Importantly, melasma does not enter the orbital rim of the eye, so the part inside the bony boundaries that um, constitute your orbital socket. You can have hyperpigmentation underneath your eyes, but again, that's another subject and the pathophysiology is different. And it's important to know because the pathophysiology of melasma isn't just blotches of hyperpigmentation, it's actually far more complex. So other forms of hyperpigmentation, you can have hyperpig that is not melasma, include hyperpigmentation from acne scars called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or hyperpigmentation from rashes. You know, you can have dandruff in here and you can get a hyperpigmentation from that, but melasma typically spares the dandruff area here. So the little groove along the nasolabial folds is often spared by melasma. You can have something called lichen planus pigmentosis, which is a rash that has a sort of brawny gray discoloration and would require a trip to a doctor to get that diagnosis straight. You can have hyperpigmentation from um, allergic reactions to medications, including allergic sun-induced reactions to medications. Again, those would require a trip to the dermatologist for a diagnosis. Melasma is that symmetric, blotchy hyperpigmentation that occurs on the face, typically doesn't pass the mandible here, and is seen more commonly in women, is related to estrogen, but not just the presence of estrogen, it's actually something to do with the estrogen receptors in the skin. And so it has also been called the mask of pregnancy. It typically shows up around the time hormones start and typically uh, subsides around the time that hormones subside at menopause. Um, and if you, if you have melasma induced by being on birth control pills or hormone supplements, you actually have to stop them all together. It's not a matter of, you know, gradations of hormones. It's actually, you know, sort of an on-off switch in a way. So it's complicated. And what else is complicated about melasma is there are a number of inflammatory aspects to it. So there's pigment production, but there's a lot of inflammation that drives melasma and that we want to address as well. It's why we can't just 
try to, you know, completely stay out of the sun and expect it to be entirely turned off. So I'm going to turn to my highly schematic drawing. Here is the dead skin cell layer, and these are dead cells up here, so um, they're just sort of like a, a line or a, a crust that's on the, on the outside of us. And here's our living cells called the epidermis, and the basilar layer of the epidermis with this thickly bounded membrane here. Here's the dermis with blood vessels, and then here's our fat. So this is our skin. And what happens is we make pigment by virtue of an enzyme um, called tyrosinase, and tyrosinase is located in our pigment producing cells which are in the epidermis, um, and those are called melanocytes. And so in response to light and sometimes just natural physiology, um, the melanocytes make melanin by virtue of tyrosinase, and it's transferred either into the living cells called keratinocytes and then carried up through the dead skin cell layer and knowing that's important to understand some of the recommendations I'm going to have. So the melanin granules are, are passed into the keratinocytes and up in, and transit up into the dead skin cell layer. But in melasma, there's actually a, a, a UV-induced um, abnormality in, in this important basement membrane that would normally keep all your pigment up here and it allows pigment to drop down here and be picked up by your scavenger cells um, which in this case would be called melanophages and they pick up stuff in the skin that doesn't belong there. They're like our little, I like to think of Pac-Man but that might date me, little garbage collector cells. And so they're down here and they're filled with melanin granules and they're really hard to treat once it gets down there. So prevention with melasma is really important and the knowledge that the, the melanin is down here and that Part of it was a disruption of the dermal junction, the epidermal dermal junction here. That's all really important in, in terms of um, understanding why you need a pretty big approach when it comes to addressing your melasma. So, so um, treatment uh, principles for uh, controlling your melasma in your skincare include, of course, blocking the light. And it's not just UV light from sunlight. Interestingly, um, ambient light in light bulbs, indoor light, um, infrared light is also capable of turning on this process of melasma and, that, and that's going to become important in a minute when I explain to you how we're going to block some of that light getting into your skin. And then um, inflammation down here is important because it helps the proliferation of the blood vessels here and it also seems to drive whatever it is that's going on here in the pathophysiology of melasma so we want to sort of help control inflammation as well and the inflammation causes the cells of the dermis to do all sorts of things such as make these blood vessels and perhaps even make the um, dermal epidermal junction more permeable to the melanocytes so again inflammation is driving many abnormalities in skin including this what seems to be a simple pigment issue, but it's far from simple. Uh, so ways that we can um, address melasma. We want to try to address it by doing things to the tyrosinase enzyme. We can inhibit tyrosinase with hydroquinone, which is available over the counter in skin lightening products. There's also um, botanical skin lighteners like arbutin and kojic acid, which will also help to inhibit the tyrosinase enzyme. And then vitamin C and azelaic acid can do it as well, though they're not quite as good as the hydroquinone, the arbutin, and the kojic acid. We can downregulate the function of the tyrosinase enzyme with retinoids, such as over-the-counter retinol, and also with glycolic acid, which um, also will help with another step too, making those one of my you know, top choices. We can decrease inflammation, which is helping to drive a lot of this misadventure that's causing the body to store some of the melanin in places that it really doesn't belong. Um, and we can decrease inflammation with green tea. And also we can use over-the-counter hydrocortisone, although that has some side effects. Um, and then we can increase cell turnover. And what that does is it increases the epidermal keratinocyte turnover and the desquamation or loss of the dead skin cells which are holding pigment up here to help improve the appearance of the melasma quickly. And we do that again with glycolic acid and Retin-A, one of the reasons I'm such a, uh, an absolutely obsessed fan of glycolic acid and Retin-A. It does many things by many mechanisms. 
super multitaskers. And then the other aspects of treating melasma, of course, need to be considered within the context of complete skin care. So complete skin care is, of course, cleanse, correct, hydrate, and protect. And so with a um, melasma um, skincare routine, my approach is to try to stack all of those steps in our favor so that we get our tyrosinase modifying actives in and that we support the skin to help prevent inflammation because some of these products can be irritating and skin that's prone to melasma is also prone to post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation if we overdo it in our zeal to improve the melasma. So when I have people craft a skincare routine for melasma, I want you to pick a cleanser that gets your skin really clean but doesn't overdo it. So I don't want you to use an irritating cleanser in your, in your effort to get you know, your barrier really ready to absorb active. So I want you to pick something that fits your skin. If you have oily skin, you have more uh, latitude in the cleansers that you choose, uh, you know, a natural soap if you're inclined towards natural products or a foaming cleanser. If you have sensitive skin, then you would want to pick a, a pH balanced um, synthetic uh, detergent called a Syndit uh, for cleansing your skin. And you may want to do a secondary cleansing step with something gentle like a witch hazel based toner to help um, remove oil without irritation. And then, um, and then you want to, uh, for correct, you want to use your correcting products. And so, you know, 2% hydroquinone is a great option. Um, the um, uh, botanical arbutin and kojic acid are great options and then I actually would recommend that you um, focus on getting in your green tea for the anti-inflammatory effect and I tend to like things going from thin to thick just for percutaneous absorption so um, often you can find uh, thinner products here and green tea products may be thinner uh, as well and then your um, retinoid and your glycolic acid would go on after that. And the glycolic acid I like during the day because the retinoid goes on at night because retinoids like retinol are inactivated by light and so you need to use them at night time. So I put the glycolic during the day. Now if you have super tough skin, you can actually stack your glycolic twice a day, but um, I would not recommend that. And because both of these products can be irritating, I would recommend starting with one gingerly you know dip your toe in it see how you're doing with it not your toe but you know gingerly sort of begin your skin with it see how it goes as your skin uh, acclimatizes it's like weightlifting you know as your skin adjusts and acclimatizes you will be able to increase uh, the usage maybe you start every other day every third day you go to every day and then you can add the other ones say you start with the retinoid then you can go with your glycolic and then um, moisturize you know, if these products didn't come in moisturizing basis, you need a good moisturizer because if you're starting to irritate your skin, you're going to be ruining the integrity of the skin barrier. You're going to end up with irritant dermatitis, which if you're prone to melasma, may end up hyperpigmenting. It can become a terrible vicious cycle. So hydrating is really important. So pick a moisturizer that your skin likes. And then blocking light is really important. And so I'm a zinc oxide fan. I think it does the best job with broad spectrum protection. Of course, you want an SPF 30 or higher, and you want your product to say broad spectrum protection. But now we also know that you want iron oxide in, in your um, skincare routine. So iron oxide can come in your sunscreen, and actually you're gonna start seeing more sunscreen products with iron oxide in them to block visible light for the purposes of helping people with melasma because it's such a common problem. Um, but you can also get iron oxide in your mineral makeups. And in fact, you know, our mineral makeup, I called the, um, the distributor and I said, so what's the content of the iron oxide in our, in our mineral makeup? And one of the powders, which was one of the ones she knew offhand that had a lower concentration was 14%. You want to look for 3.2% or higher. So if you're using mineral makeup on top of your zinc oxide sunscreen, you're already starting to get some iron oxide in your skincare and eventually you're going to start to see even more specific definitions and um and if you if you're not getting anywhere with that then you can consider adding a little hydrocortisone in your skincare routine but again that can result in skin atrophy and does require supervision even if it's over the counter i, I wouldn't recommend doing it on your own and we're also going to see some new interesting things coming out. There's one that's over the counter that I've not tried. It smells like rotten eggs called cysteamine, and we'll write that down in here. 
Um, so that's an that's an option if you have if you've already tried all of this and and your melasma is really stubborn. Um, and there are procedures that you can consider having done, but again, if they are overdone, you can end up hyperpigmenting from them, and that would require a trip to your doctor or skincare professional. And you want to be on down-regulating and inhibiting tyrosinase products if you're going to think about doing anything to your skin. So I hope that helps. It's a very comprehensive look at what's new in melasma and what you can do to craft a skincare routine to help your melasma. Thank you. And I'm going to put also um, at the bottom of this a link for another uh, post that I've written on melasma to give you a little more information. And if you found this helpful, please like the video, share it with your friends, and consider um, hitting that red button for subscribe. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.